Drew's latest work is a collection of nine short science fiction stories from an indigenous point of view. It's called Take Us to Your Chief and Other Stories. In the spirit of full disclosure, Drew and I have worked together before, and he is a dear friend of mine. Drew, your bibliography is the length of my arm, and I've got a considerably long arm. But this is your first foray into science fiction. Kinda, kinda. If you, uh, I had a, my very first play was called Toronto Dreamers Rock, and it dealt with three 16 year old boys, one from now, one from 100 years in the future, and one from 400 years in the past that meet at the top of this sacred site and interrelate and connect as only 16 year olds can. So that was the, one of the very first things I wrote, and I guess I was still testing the waters back then for such a project. And then one of my later plays, Alternatives, had a central character uh, who was a young uh, Ojibwe um, a writer who wanted to write indigenous science fiction and um, uh, no relation whatsoever. So, so you've been a proponent of indigenous I've been kicking around literature. it for a long time. I mean, I've been a fan ever since I can remember. Um, but the concept of native science fiction is almost like an oxymoron, right? A contradiction in term. Nobody would ever put those yeah. two together. And so I think I actually wanted to, to tackle this ever since I can remember, but I was afraid to because it just was not something um, normally explored by Indigenous authors. Now, I remember having a conversation with you once and I was reaching for somebody's name that I couldn't remember, and you just started naming off like every author that seems to have ever written science fiction. Can you remember back to like where that love affair started, where you first found it? <laughs> Well, it started when I was a kid on the reserve, and I, I guess you could say it started through television. Um, you know, Star Trek, Space 1999, all those shows way back when, they sort of whetted my appetite about what what was possible, what if, that wonderful term used for all writing, but especially in terms of science fiction. So I read about it, I, I watched it, and then I read it, and then I, st um, I started sort of in my mind playing around with different pro uh, perspectives on how to approach certain Indigenous issues through using science fiction tools. And then finally it got to the point of where, you know, instead of thinking about it, toying with the idea, why not just sit down and do it? Mm. For so many people, me included, you were the first Indigenous person that we ever read. You've been writing for so long, so prolifically. You're always a proponent of Indigenous literature. What did you think that you could do with science fiction that you haven't done yet with all your other uh, avenues? Well, one of my concerns about contemporary First Nations literature is it seems to walk a, a narrow path in terms of exploration. It's either historically based or it's victim narrative or it deals with the um, side effects and the fallout from what I refer to as post-contact stress disorder. Yes, perfect. <laughs> right? And so uh, uh, I thought there are so many different... Uh, branches of the Native experience. There's so many different shades of Aboriginal um, consciousness that I, there's more to our journey than just those dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry stories. Why not celebrate some of the wonderful possibilities that, that exist within our culture? My very first novel was a Native vampire novel. Yeah, right. and it was lovely. I so enjoyed that. Uh, my second novel was what I guess could be called magic realism, and you know, and in my my plays, I did um, a, I was once asked to adapt and indigenize a 1930s Bertolt Brecht Kurt Vile beer hall communist tinged musical. And I said, <laughs> "Yeah, why not?" <laughs> that Once, sounds like a fit. <laughs> that was fun. So, so I'm all about twisting or melding or exploring genres. I mean, we have people like. Tom King, whose hobby is writing murder mysteries, indigenous yeah. murder mysteries. Yeah. We've, there's a book by um, um, uh, Kateri Akwinzi uh, Dam that is a collection of um, international indigenous erotica, mm. sort of like Fifty Shades of Red, <laughs> right? And uh, Daniel Heath Justice has a book of, um, of elves and sword and sorcery kind of thing. So the idea of doing a native science fiction wasn't that different once you just sort of looked at it in black and white, you know? Um, it was just a matter of, of exploring Indigenous issues using different tools mm. um, that prov are provided by science fiction. Science fiction is the exploration of the, like all literature, 
the exploration of uh, human or society, uh, human uh, issues and society. It's just being filtered through um, technology or alien or whatever. And the interesting thing I found in writing this book, I think the dominant metaphor that came across for me and might possibly pop up if indigenous science fiction takes off is contact. Mm, right? Yeah. Uh, um, aliens coming to Earth and the whole, how do you deal with first contact there? Because we're still dealing with our first contact from 500 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Let's give the listener an idea of the kind of stuff in the book. One story, which happens to be my favorite, Dreams of Doom, describes a full-on conspiracy theory with the government spying on Indigenous people through dream catchers. Now, I have to tell you, Drew, I am in my room reading this and as I'm reading it I'm looking and there's like a dream catcher on the window and there's and I go in another room and there's a dream catcher in there and, and it was And you just, have earrings? My, my dream catcher earrings and I'm just thinking oh my goodness the government could get at me every every way possible what inspired that that whole storyline? Well, I was sitting I was looking at dream catchers like you know I have them I think every indigenous person has them and many non-indigenous people have them and I was looking at them and they for would remind me of those um, um, radar dishes that they have, you know, they're circular and they have the wiring all through it. And, and on some of them, they have like um, uh, beads or crystals in them. And it struck me like it's like a big, huge radar antenna or radio <laughs> antenna. And the more I thought about it and, and, and how would I make this into a government plot and the fact, as I just said, usually it's Indigenous people who have them or those supporting Indigenous causes who have them. <laughs> and ever since, um, you know, uh, Oka and then Ipperwash and Gustafsson Lake and all these different things, sort of the, the ongoing, uh, aggressive and political um, um, thrust of the Native community, maybe the government decided to find a way to try and control Canada's Indigenous people and, and what a better way than having them market it themselves. And I just sort of started putting <laughs> that all together and I sat writing it. And it, the thing is, it just made way too much sense. Yeah, there was a point where you talk about there's like, a, I think it was 142 Native women employed by the government across the country to make these things. And my first thought is, oh my God, I know who those women are in my territory. <laughs> this is freaking me out. It was funny because at the same time that I kept laughing as I was reading it, I was also looking at the dream catchers thinking, oh, what, a, what an interesting concept. Humor always has that role in your writing. Even when it's heavy writing, there's always a place for us to release with the laughter. How do you look at humor in conjunction with these science fiction stories? Well, one of the things I learned as a humorist or, or, or um, somebody who writes humor is the worst thing you can do is to try and be funny. Because it sounds like you're trying to be funny. Right. I mean, it sounds so simple, so obvious, so easy when you say the humor has to be organic. But unfortunately, that I've learned that through hard experience. So when I sit down and write something like that, the actual premise is dripping in irony itself. And if I just let that sit there and grow by itself, it will take care of itself. I don't sit there and try, I'm going to make this as ironic as possible. I'm going to make this funny, that funny. Um, the story itself looked as I was writing it looked after itself right yeah. and within the spectrum of the book some stories are funnier than others take us to your chief yeah. right and others are a little more serious like lost in space you know how do you be how do you be a respectful native person in outer space right yeah, you know you yeah. don't have the four directions yeah. all that sort of stuff um and but I, I, even even the dark darker ones like um uh, Mr. Gizmo right, dealing with teen suicide. Yeah. That was dark, but it was from the perspective of a toy robot that had come to life. And it just seemed as is the Aboriginal experience. You know, they have the, I like to often use that term about uh, Greek theater. You have the, the tragic mask and the comedy mask and they're just flip sides of each other. And I think it's the same with Native people, if not more so. Where there's tragedy, there's humor. Where there's humor, there can be tragedy. Mm. And um, it's my firm belief that it's been our sense of humor that, that has allowed us to survive over 500 years of colonization. And I try and highlight it, I try and embrace it, and I try and um, share it with the world. 
I absolutely agree in terms of humor being the the medicine that has got us through. Um, you you brought up "Take Us to Your Chief," which is the title story. Let's talk about it for a sec. Um, aliens land uh, in Otter Lake, an Ojibwe First Nation, um, and stories of first contact are so popular in science fiction. But you, of course, brought a new element to it. Tell the tell the listener. Well, it's actually first contact is explored in two of the stories. One of them called a culturally inappropriate Armageddon which has more of a tragic but still funny ending. And this one is just sheer celebration of the indigenous sense of humor, where these three characters who just spend the summer sitting by the lake uh, with a cooler of beer, just enjoying the wonders of a summer day and and the, the, the lake and beer. And then one day the spaceship drops into their lap and um, the aliens come out saying they've come from some far off uh, planet and basically they're here uh, to open um, uh, like a, a consulate or whatever and uh, do introductions. And so they say, you know, take us to your leader, which in that case was taken <laughs> to the chief. So they take them to the band office, they meet the chief, all this sort of stuff happens and it has kind of a, what I think is a fun ending. It, 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 it forever science fiction has allowed people to look at issues of inequality Star Trek did it so well in fact Star Trek is probably the first television show where you saw a diverse cast uh, on the screen in what ways do you see that showing up in this collection of books well I mean the, th the interesting thing about science fiction is it allows you science fiction was originally a form of metaphor it was the ability to explore something that either would be too didactic uh, as, as a political or, or, or a philosophical story or treaty or whatever, and or even as um, some other literary property. But if you wrap it in um, science or in a larger, um, different context, you don't know what's at the core until it sinks into your consciousness. Um, so in dealing, that's what you said, um, Star Trek dealt with the Vietnam War, it dealt with racism, mm. it dealt with a whole bunch of different things that were happening in uh, North America, in the world in the 1960s. So in, within the context of my book, I'm dealing with issues that are happening in the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal community right now, uh, teen suicide um, and, 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 and t topics like that. So it just provides me with an opportunity to take these stories that are that are we're all very very familiar with, and just sort of put some hot sauce on them and mm. make them make them make them a little different and a little more palatable. If you're just joining, you're listening to Q. I'm Candy Palmiter, and I'm speaking with award-winning playwright, novelist, and humorist Drew Hayden Taylor about his brand new collection of short stories that are science fiction indigenous short stories called Take Us to Your Chief. A few of the stories look at cultural loss. You've got an indigenous dude thinking about how to connect to his culture in space uh, and another who travels through time to learn about his history through ancient engravings called petroglyphs. How can science fiction help us connect to history and culture? Oh, that's a good question. I don't see why it can't. It's like, it's like any other form of literature. It, it is a springboard for thought, for exploration. It provides you an opportunity to take something that we're all familiar with, as I was saying earlier, and just give it a new polish, give it a new paint job so that we can um, um, observe it from a new angle. Um, the one lost in space, which deals with uh, an astronaut who finds out his, great, his grandfather died, who's native, and he's up there. And I mean, it's a topic that I think a lot of us deal with, how to be native in a big city, mm, right? Absolutely. But up there... You know, they, he, he can't smudge because of the, the, the oxygen uh, requirements within his spaceship. The, you know, how do you, how do you acknowledge the four directions when there are no four directions? Uh, you know, a father, uh, mother, earth, father, sky, not there. You know, <laughs> yeah. so it's like dealing with all these things that you would normally wouldn't think would be an issue, but it, but it is for him. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the petroglyphs one, talking about sort of dealing with... Um, I come from uh, a reserve north of Peterborough where we have the famous Peterborough petroglyphs. And I remember looking at them and then you, I have been, I've been to China, I've been all over the place of the world and there are petroglyphs everywhere. Mm. 
Mm. And a lot of them look alike. And I thought, what if they were like corridors to each other? And not only to them to each other, but to through different time periods and and because there's again crystals within those rocks, because a lot of them are done on, on on granite or or marble or limestone, or whatever. And some of them, what if they're sort of set up a sort of harmonic that sort of open doorways and just you know, just playing with with concepts that is what science fiction is about. And what would happen? You know, it's not not so much, you know, I was thinking I come up I come up with the concept of petroglyphs on a rock. Somebody sort of sits there and the thing is the character who discovers it plays guitar and knows knows um, music. Right. And he's looking at it and he can read it like you would bars of music. It follows a linear path and a and a chord progression in in his own mind and he says, I can see where this is going. And he sort of puts in another note and if it has to be the right note, because if you're playing music and you put in the wrong note, it, the song doesn't work. Right. You can hear it. And same with the petroglyph. Whereas, but he's like spins, he's, I think, on that island for a week looking at this and he finally figures out where it goes. He does that and it opens a portal into time mm. and it goes back and forth. And it's just sort of, and, he, and it gives him a new way of approaching his culture, going back in time when white people have just arrived. But it also uh, opens another Pandora's box, appropriating a cultural icon from Greek mythology. <laughs> uh, and uh, again, it, it turns things around. It's a fun read. It's a. It, it's not something that you're going to be uh, bogged down with. But at the same time, I kept seeing different kinds of messaging uh, from different perspectives. When you wrote it, who did you write it for? Oh, that's a tough question. I, you know, I've always hated authors and songwriters and and people like that who say I wrote it for myself. I hate that that kind <laughs> of answer. But I have to say. I did. <laughs> I, I pictured myself as a 12-year-old kid back on the reserve reading science fiction or reading books and, again, not seeing our experiences in this book. And I just I just was, like, writing away thinking this is just so cool. This is so much fun. You know, the one character, the, the sto- stars about, the th- again, the three 16-year-old boys. I took my play and sort of gave it a short story context. Um, and uh, these three 16-year-old boys looking up at the stars and wondering what if. And mm. I tried to take that concept of what if on the larger scale of sci-fi and put it in a book where somebody like me would enjoy it. And as you said, it's not exactly brimming with hardcore, uh, hard to understand science fact no, here yeah. and there. I tried to, I mean, you know, I'm not a high, I'm not a scientist um, by any means, but having some, being somewhat familiar with science fiction, I thought I could, I could make it at least plausible. Um, you know, I, I may not get from uh, A, B, C, D, but I can get to at least A, B. I felt that for non-Indigenous people, too, it, it might be a window, a, a more palatable window into understanding some of our experiences. Was that in your mind when you were writing? Yeah, um, a culturally inappropriate Armageddon where, where the end of the world is, is, is created through an Iroquois social song, mm. right? And um, I, had a friend, I had a friend who's Iroquois, uh, Haudenosaunee, read it, and he said, you know, this is all accurate. Where'd you learn all this? And I said, oh, I've been around. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so talking about taking certain cultural... Um, touchstones that we all sort of know or are familiar with, and then using them to take them out of out of the reserve environment into the larger sci-fi environment that everybody's familiar with, and um, and and giving it that sort of resonance. Beautifully done. It is great to have a new Drew Hayden book in my hands. Thanks so much, my friend. My pleasure.